Hey everyone. Thanks so much for coming to my talk. Um, before I start, a quick question for you. How many of you have heard about Rock the JVM? Raise your hands. All right. This is the most beautiful things I've seen all day. Thank you so much for coming to my talk and for uh, following my work. Uh, you may have heard about me as the voice of Rock the JVM, so I'm going to get into my persona mode. So, hey everyone, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and you're watching Lessons from Teaching Scala to 80,000 Engineers. Um, my name is Daniel Chokorlan. I am the founder of uh, Rock the JVM, which is a project that I started out of pure curiosity, out of uh, passion for Scala and functional programming and everything that it powers. And it turned into this whole learning platform for pretty much everything in the Scala ecosystem. I'm teaching mo the most important libraries and tools in the Scala world. And I've had the privilege of uh, reaching um, tens of thousands of people all around the world and uh, training companies uh, about Scala and functional programming. Uh, you can find me at Rock the JVM. Maybe we can swap displays. All right. So you can find me at Rock the JVM on Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, you can email me at daniel at rockthejvm.com. I'm more than happy to help with pretty much every question that you may have about Scala and functional programming and everything in between. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about uh, Rock the JVM itself, but what I've learned by meeting so many people and talking to many different kinds of engineers and students with different mentalities, with different backgrounds. And hopefully by the end of this talk, we'll have some ideas about how to make Scala an easier language to learn and therefore to adopt. Because as any other idea wants to do, it wants to spread. So we would ideally want to make Scala as popular as possible. So this is my attempt to uh, share some ideas about my own learning and teaching experience with Rock the JVM. So Scala is this general purpose programming language. So this is what it advertises itself as, a general purpose programming language that can do anything for anyone. But then in practice, if we look at the people who adopt Scala, and in my own learning and teaching experience, Scala primarily targets established engineers with at least some programming experience with at least some of the language, ideally with Java or JVM background. And so you get a much narrower audience than Scala advertises itself as. But in terms of learning and teaching, we have a good side of marketing or uh, targeting established engineers and a downside to it, as well as for beginning engineers. And I'm going to talk about that next. So the positive side of targeting established developers is the fact that learners have more context while learning Scala. So when you learn Scala and you learn the idiomatic way of writing code, you then internalize these concepts much more easily into a vast array of knowledge that you already possess. So you get um, com complexities and performance implications for everything that you uh, know already integrated. You don't have to discuss about that too much, um, and so on and so forth. So the learning is internalized far more quickly. So when I show people something like this with, uh, that I typically teach in uh, one of my early stages of uh, one of my courses, now, this is the typical kind of snippet that I would show to people uh, when learning options. So you have a map with various forms of configuration. And if you get, have those configurations present, then you instantiate what I call a fictitious connection, and then you call an API on it. So this kind of thing is pretty typical in uh, our uh, FP-driven uh, Scala code. And uh, we tend to read this idiomatically. So uh, experienced engineers have generally no problem reading something like this after five minutes, uh, five minutes after learning about options. So they go like, OK, this is something that abstracts away the notion of null checks so that I don't have to write defensive code myself. OK, this is pretty cool. Uh, let me get a um, configuration, which is uh, a map. I'm going to compose some options. OK, I can, I can get the idea. So experienced engineers have an easier time understanding something like this, and after that, after I teach them four comprehensions and the general aspect of four comprehensions, which is this generalized sequential computation, if I do something like this, they read this four comprehension much more easily. And it's generally a eureka moment for them. It's a click moment when they understand that a four comprehension is not just an iteration or um, the kind of stuff that they used to do. So click moments like this happen more often for experienced engineers. Now, the downside of teaching Scala for experienced developers is that 
Not always, but sometimes, experienced engineers have their own minds already set on what good code or what things already work. So they have different habits that if, for idiomatic Scala they have to unlearn. And usually, uh, for when I get into situations like that, I get a little bit too much skepticism. A little skepticism is fine and healthy, but too much skepticism is a learning barrier to idiomatic Scala. So when I show them the same kind of code with options and um, composing possibly null values, um, the reaction that I get from, uh, this, from this kind of people is, what is this? I, I can't read this. I want my null checks back. This is much harder for me to read. Flat mapping options and indentation, and I, I just want my null checks back. And when I learn, when I teach four comprehensions, they have a hard time detaching from the idea of iteration. So usually experienced engin engineers learning Scala have an imperative background. So a four structure in a learning, in a programming language is usually taught in terms of iteration. So how come is this not iteration? Oh my God, I, now I have to think about expressions now. Nothing means anything anymore. I want, I want my old style back. So the downside of targeting experienced engineers from a learning perspective is the habits that we have to unteach or they have to unlearn so that the, uh, we can um, um, share some idiomatic way of writing Scala. Now, Scala, because it's a language for everyone, it uh, is applicable to computer science students or to beginning programmers as well. I saw something the other day uh, with somebody teaching kids how to code in Scala, which is something that uh, I am too afraid to do at the moment. Um, but she was teaching 10-year-olds how to write Scala in expression-oriented fashion, and they were doing it. They were doing it very well. So you can teach Scala to beginning programmers as well, and the good side of teaching for uh, beginning programmers is that there's nothing to unlearn. You teach programmers with a clean slate, with a fresh mind, so you can teach the uh, idiomatic way of writing Scala without any sort of learning barriers. So when I teach something like a four comprehension to um, a, a group of beginning programmers, it takes a little bit more time to read this or to understand what it does, but then once the mindset starts to uh, inhabit them, it becomes very natural to read something like this. So uh, if there is a host configuration, if there is a port configuration, if I can make a connection, then call connect on it, which is the idiomatic way of reading a for comprehension in the context of an option. And this phrasing is very important because they can abstract away much more easily later when they read for comprehensions in other contexts. For example, in the context of fail computations, in the context of effects, in the context of asynchronous computations, and so on and so forth. So the mindset takes a little bit more time to internalize, but it becomes very, very natural later on. The downside of teaching Scala to beginning programmers is that, and Scala has this reputation for becoming quite complex, is that you can get very deep very quickly. So the initial steps need hand-holding, but it's very tempting to get into the very high-level abstractions or in the very deep, let's say, complex things very quickly, and it starts to become overwhelming. So when I show them something like this, or when they, they see something like this in real-life code, this is just one definition that I use in one of my projects at, at Rock.jvm. This thing takes like five minutes to read. For experienced engineers or for Scala developers such as this audience, it doesn't take too long. We have some context bounds, we have some higher kind of types and so on and so forth, and we have some uh, dependency injection in there. But um, it doesn't take that much. For uh, the audience here, it probably takes five seconds. But for beginning engineers, seeing this for the first time, it takes five minutes, not five seconds. So Scala can get pretty overwhelming pretty quickly. Now, at this point, we have two sets of learning barriers, one set of learning barriers for experienced engineers and one set of learning barriers for beginning engineers. Now, if we want to make Scala an easier language to learn, we need to address these learning barriers for everyone so that more people come and join us in this very nice little world with Scala. So for me at Rock the JVM, I have a challenge because if I want to make a learning experience, if I want to make some materials to learn and teach Scala, I have to address all these problems in, in one go. I, uh, I cannot really scale myself and create materials just for uh, every single niche audience. Um, so I have to create a single learning experience that caters to all these problems. 
So I have to get back to the basics, to what effective and accelerated learning means. So I use a little framework that I call the DSL, something that is easier for us to remember. But it doesn't mean DSL in the tagless final sense. It means deconstruct, select, and linearize. These are my steps for learning something myself in my own life. So I, I apply this into my own life and in my own career. And this learning process and this teaching process, I have learned from a very uncommon place, a very counterintuitive, counterintuitive place, which is a cookbook. I learned this from a cookbook. It's called The 4-Hour Chef from an author called Tim Ferriss. You may have heard of him. As in, he's now a popular podcaster. But this cookbook, I, by the way, I'm not affiliated into uh, this book in any way. I'm not here to sell, uh, to sell any books. I'm just talking about something that impressed me. So this book is not about cooking. This is a book about accelerated learning applied to cooking. I'm a terrible cook. I have no idea how to cook basically anything. But I did learn the, uh, the accelerated learning process, which is the first chapter of this book. So cooking is just the medium for applying the accelerated learning principle, which I've simplified into my DSL framework. Deconstruct, select, and linearize. I'm going to talk about these steps. Deconstructing is uh, pretty self-explanatory, which is breaking a topic down into its constituent parts. But my threshold for teaching Scala in particular means that a topic is sufficiently broken down with sufficient granularity that I can teach it in 30 minutes or less, or maybe 100 lines of code. So 30 minutes or 100 lines of code is sufficient for a topic to be taught. If this topic takes more, then I have to break it down further, which means that I have to apply a recursive algorithm to do it. Select. Well, after you've broken down a topic, you have a suite of subtopics. So these subtopics generally have no connection to them at first glance because you ha only have a list. But once you start digging into them, you understand that there are some connections and also that some topics are more important than others. So you have to apply a selection process because otherwise you'll spend your entire time just learning one, you want one small thing and you forget about everything else and you don't have the time. So I have to optimize for learning time. This is my primary goal at Rock the JVM is to compress the learning time for a uh, prospective learner. After that, I have to linearize, which means that I have to cast a thread with a sequential learning process so that a learner doesn't have to think about what to learn next and in what order. They just click play, and then the course just goes by itself, and everything just builds step by step. And that is not as easy a process as uh, appears at first glance. I have to do a lot of experiments to understand what uh, the best linearization means. So I'm going to show an example. What does it mean to apply this DSL principle to Scala generics? Now, when you think about Scala generics, you think about something like maybe a list of integers, like something like this. But then if you start, if you think for five more seconds about this, generics will imply many, many other concepts. So you have higher kind of types, you have multiple type arguments, you have type bounds, you have context bounds, you have variants, you have all sorts of different problems and aspects of generics. So you need to sit and um, try to break this down into the constituent parts or, let's say, um, the lateral aspects of generics. So this is a non-exhaustive list about what it means to teach a generic so that you can understand it completely or fully, right? So after you've deconstructed this, you've, you have a list of things that you want to learn or, in my case, teach to uh, prospective learners. OK, we have a list. Now, the next step is to select. Now, after I select, I'm, I need to understand what are the topics that are important about generics. Now, uh, when you look at that list, you may ask what, what is important. And in real life, pretty much everything is important, but you have to understand that people's time is limited, as was mine when I was learning Scala. So when you have, for example, uh, 30 minutes to learn, you can't learn the entire generic, generics things in 30 minutes. You have to um, apply some selection and prioritization. So in my particular, uh, particular um, situation with generics and uh, Rock the JVM courses, I split this list into two, let's say, subgroups. One list that is very important for beginners to understand so that they can be productive in most Scala projects, 
and the other list for advanced engineers writing their own libraries or uh, d uh, writing some abstractions or uh, things uh, that are, let's say, more complicated. So the selection criteria in my case means splitting the C into two uh, different um, subgroups. Now, after the selection pr process, my third step is linearized. So if you look at this, these lists, these you know, subtopics have connections to each other. So you have to, let's say, topologically sort this graph so that we can understand what needs to be taught first. So I need to cast a thread out of all these subtopics so that a learner doesn't have to think about whether or not a particular topic has connection to whatever they've, lived, they've learned before. That is my job. So um, I uh, created this um, uh, order to understand generics. First of all, to understand the reason or the need for generics to um, reuse code on multiple different types. The mechanics of generics, what it means to use type arguments inside um, the uh, block of a method or the block of a uh, trait or a class and so on and so forth, so how generics actually work. And after you've established the general principles, you can uh, broad, uh, broaden your horizons and then you can uh, teach different um, more complicated topics related to generics like higher kind of types and multiple type arguments and type bounds and things of that sort. All right, so this is a... DSL principle, the deconstruct, select, and linearize sequence that I apply pretty much to everything that I teach. And I, uh, I've been uh, doing Rock the JVM for more than eight years now, so I've had the chance to apply this principle over and over and over again. The problem with learning and the problem with teaching is that as enthusiastic as we are to teach a complicated topic, like maybe variants or Mona tutorials, um, as teachers, there is an itch to give the learner or the audience the tiny little pieces that build up to this grand result that we want to show. For example, in Monad tutorials, we might want to talk uh, to our students about what functors are, what applicatives are, what rules monads have to satisfy, and then we have this grand monad concept that solves everything in, in the known universe. But that's a problem because we don't really want to optimize for complexity, we want to optimize for the learning experience. And I want to give you an, give an example. This is uh, an uh, article that I stumbled upon the other day from a game designer. This game designer found out that when he uh, taught the player how to play the game, he was actually designing a learning experience. And this tutorial, or the tutorial that he wanted to make, was something along these lines. So the player wanted to get through a door. So the tutorial in the initial, in the initial phase, the tutorial would walk the user through the maze, they would collect the key, and then the tutorial would guide the, the player to a door. Obviously, the door would open because the user had the key at that moment. At level two, the user had to unlock a locked door, but they didn't have the key yet. So they were stumped. They didn't know what to do because in the previous level, in the tutorial level, they already have been given the key. So that was a bad learning experience because the player did not understand or it, the tutorial did not make, make it clear to them about the association between the need to open the door and the need to search for the key first and then to open the door. They were given the key uh, outright. And that's a problem for us too, because as we design learning experience or tutorials, we have this itch to give students the little bits and pieces without, under, without having them understand the need for those pieces first. So for example, in Monad tutorials, we define functors, we define applicatives, we define a special functor called a flat map, Everything fits nice and well. We have this API with pure and flat map, and we have this grand um, concept called a monad, which um, solves everything in the known universe. But that's a problem because it causes confusion. I have seen so many monad tutorials, and I've been guilty of making monad tutorials myself, that um, I've been confused for years before I could understand, um, I can understand the concept nicely. So we design tutorials with good intentions by applying this linearized principle, but with the wrong objective, with the wrong objective function. We don't need to optimize for complexity because, the, um, because programmers are generally quite um, adept at understanding complexity, but because we're human beings, we need to understand or internalize the need to solve for 
the, um, a particular set of problems. So we need to optimize for the problems and for the learning experience itself, not for complexity for complexity's sake. So I've done an experiment, very scientifically accurate experiment, with um, uh, three Monad tutorials. So I've made no less than three Monad tutorials out, uh, out there. They're all on YouTube, and they're on different structures. Monad tutorial number one, the exact structure that I was talking about. Define functor, define applicative, define flat map, and we have this nice type class hierarchy that, that uh, designs this grand Monad um, data structure. Monad tutorial number two, define a monoid, and then abstract the crap out of it until nothing means anything anymore. Composition means nothing. We have higher kind of types. Even the function itself has been abstracted away in the, into this higher kind of type. Then we have this higher kind of functor with the map being a natural transformation. Call that natural transformation a flat map, and you have this um, infamous expression in functional uh, world, which is uh, monads are monoids in the category of endo functors. So there you go. There you have the perfect monad tutorial ever. Nobody can complain about that. Monad tutorial number three. Show us some defensive code with null checks and explain the need for options. Show some, uh, some potentially fail computations. Show the need for try. Define a data structure that abstracts away uh, the uh, thread safety for accessing a value, and then compose that. Show the parallel of composing data structures, like option, try, and that particular thread safe value. Do we see a pattern here? That pattern is called, and so on and so forth. So the scientific experiment was which one of these Monad tutorials was the most popular? So the scientific experiment said Monad tutorial number one, at the time that I'm speaking this, it gathered around 6,000 views on my YouTube channel. Monad tutorial number two, 7,000 views. These are the masochists. Monad tutorial number three, 30,000 views. So as scientific as this experiment is, we, get, we can get a picture of what kind of sequential learning the audience resonates to best. So Monet tutorial number three, which is designing a learning experience based on problems and how to solve the problems in an easier way, this is what resonates best. And I've created Rock the JVM and all my courses around this sort of, um, this sort of structure. So, all in all, effective teaching for Scala means to use this DSL framework, at least in my experience, optimized by the need or by the need to solve problems, not for the complexity for complexity's sake. The order matters, so you need to be careful what you say when, because if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, you can cause confusion more than you can cause this kind of eureka moment that we all aspire to. As functional programmers and uh, especially when we understand monads, we have this itch to write a monad tutorial. This is probably human nature. After you understand monads, you probably have the need to write a monad tutorial. So we need to be aware of this itch to get to the punchline or to the final grand result, because everyone has their different learning, uh, let's say, learning background or learning process or learning context, and everybody needs to be, have the space to get to their own eureka moment. Now, I'm going to give some examples of Eureka moments that I've seen in my, uh, in my own courses and, and uh, training sessions. For example, the, um, the aspect of thinking in terms of expressions. So programming is, is an extension of basic math, and Scala is not just a better Java with some nicer syntax, but it's a different kind of thinking and approaching code. So once you start a to understand code and think in terms of expressions, everything becomes easier to learn later. So um, I want to design these learning moments so that people have the option or rather the more, more power to get better learning, better Eureka moments later. So uh, when you start to think in terms of expressions, everything becomes easier later. Starting from some very easy things like if conditions, this is one of the first things that I teach in Scala, 10 minutes into my course, I teach something like this. Let's not think about if, uh, if structures as uh, imperative forms of associating a value, but rather an expression that itself evaluates to a value. And then thinking with, uh, in terms of expressions makes everything else easier. So data transformations, effect systems, asynchronous code, and so on and so forth. So this is a soft Eureka moment that creates more Eureka moments later. Another thing, 
functional programming and object-oriented programming. Usually, most of my students have at least a notion of what OOP means, and FP is initially thought of as an antagonist of OOP. But you don't really need to have um, an antithesis between them, you can have both. So you can teach the fact that function values, which is something that we uh, teach in functional programming, are actually instances of classes, which is something that very easily resonates with Java programmers. So function values are just instances of this function one trait, or function two, or function n traits. Likewise, for comprehensions themselves are not loops. They're not syntactic structures that are, uh, let's say, uh, with a different uh, with a different mechanics in the, in the language itself, as is in other programming languages, but the for structure itself is something that compiles to map and flat map. So after you get something like this, after you get this idea, later eureka moments become easier, or they have a higher chance of occurring. Now, speaking of for comprehensions, they can mean a lot of things. So philosophically, a for comprehension can be read in different ways. So you can start with a for comprehension teaching that as an iteration in the sense that, let's say, you have two lists and you, have two, uh, you can make combinations between these lists, but then when you apply the flat map and map structure to other contexts, like options and tries and effects and state changes and so on and so forth, you start to read for comprehensions differently. And that will ease your way into other tools in the Scala ecosystem. So this paves the way for easier, more, uh, more effective and faster learning for other tools in the Scala ecosystem, like effect systems, like Zeo or Cas Effect. Another thing, variance. Variance is a, let's say, one of the harder topics to teach, in my experience, for Scala developers. But it's quite easy to teach when you um, create the idea that variance just means substitution in the object-oriented programming sense, the list of substitution. So, for example, uh, for covariant types, a list of dogs is a list of animals, so that if you write that in code, it makes perfect sense. Or a vet of pets is also a vet of dog because they can, they can treat any kind of animal so they can treat your dog as well. So by making this parallels or this associations with real life scenarios or things that we would naturally write in code, these kinds of hard abstract concepts become easier to learn and understand. Now, for the mathematically inclined, you can also teach something like variance in terms of inclusion. So um, we can uh, create the sort of relationships between sets, which are the abstract notion of what a type is embedded in a functional, in, in a language. Also, you can deliver the punchline, but after you establish some context, you can deliver a punchline on how to pick variance for your type. So if it produces something, make it covariant. If it consumes something, make it contravariant. Or you can even deliver that little one line of code, which encapsulates pretty much everything that you may, uh, that you may need in variance. But that's later, after you establish enough, enough context. Now, I mentioned earlier that you need to be careful as a teacher what to say when, because otherwise you can create confusions. So if you say the right thing at the right time, you can increase the chances of a eureka or a click moment occurring much easier. So for example, for Java programmers, the fact that we um, design objects as singletons with one line of code clicks in their mind very, very easily. So for Java programmers and with the object-oriented gang of four design patterns, singletons are one of the classic design patterns. So when you write the single line of code that solves that whole problem in just two words, that is generally uh, what raises, um, what creates at least the stage for um, something, uh, for a click moment. Now, after you've established this background, when we say that objects have a different philosophical meaning, like uh, they allow the uh, context for writing static fields and methods so that you uh, separate what is static from what is non-static, as opposed to Java or other languages that mix them all in the same class, you get some, uh, some nice okay signs from the audience, at least I did in my own trainings. So something like this, where you separate a class with its companion object, and when you separate these functionalities by keeping the object-oriented structure, that is when things click much more easily with uh, students with OOP backgrounds. Also, um, for um, uh, programmers with imperative backgrounds, most programming languages have this structure of um, 
switch cases. So when I teach pattern matching, I make the case that pattern matching is initially like a switch on steroids. Well, you have multiple cases and then you can return different expressions. But then as I start to um, outline the different features of pattern matching, which is the ability to bind patterns and the ability to match sub patterns and so on and so forth, people start to give me okay signs in much, uh, let's say, with mu much greater intensity because pattern matching is far, far more powerful than just a switch on steroids. It's one of the mo most powerful Scala features in my opinion, and rightfully so, and this creates the necessary um, Scala is pretty great kind of uh, reaction in my audience. Likewise, map, flat map, and filter. M map, flat map, and filter, or with filter, the, they are super important in later abstractions when you want to talk about effects or um, asynchronous computations or apps and values and so on and so forth. So it's easy to understand map, flat map, or filter slash with filter with collections first because uh, they have the notion of what it means to process a list. But then after you design four comprehensions and uh, show them the, the sort of sequential, the sequential aspect of a four comprehension, the detachment between the detachment from the notion of iteration becomes far easier and this creates or this paves the way for greater teaching or more uh, easier or easier learning later. What I suggest not to do at the beginning, especially if you're teaching juniors in your company or uh, holding a, a talk about, let's say, a, two hour, a one hour crash course into Scala or essential features of Scala, um, there is a temptation to show Scala uh, as very similar to other programming languages by showing variables and loops. I would recommend not to use variables and loops as a starting point to teaching Scala because in my, in my experience teaching this sort of thing, so I've done many experiments uh, throughout the years, uh, I've noticed that this simply solidifies old, uh, old patterns and it's much harder to unlearn them later. So these things, I actually teach them after I uh, teach the functional programming aspect of Scala or the idiomatic Scala um, uh, way of writing code. So uh, people understand that there is such a thing as a variable, there is such a thing as a loop. Obviously, this doesn't take a million years to understand, so um, this becomes more natural for them, but after they internalize the uh, idiomatic Scala code. One other framework that I like to use that um, proved very useful for me while learning and teaching Scala is what I, uh, is this little second book, Atomic Habits. Um, again, you may have heard of it. I don't, I'm not interested in uh, uh, selling the book or anything. It probably did very well without me. Um, but I learned a framework for adopting good habits in my life or breaking bad habits. And I want to embed that in my teaching process because the uh, teaching or learning is uh, very common to us programmers and it never stops, so it might as well become a habit. The framework for adopting a good habit is to make it obvious. So for example, if you want to work out, a good way of increasing your chances that you will work out in that day is to prepare your workout clothes and put them in the middle of the room. You cannot help but notice them next day you, woke, you wake up. The second step is to make it attractive. So you might imagine yourself having that six pack or having the best uh, physical aspect or the, uh, the physical state in your body um, after you're working out so that you can get into the mood of working out. The third step is to make it easy. So you might prepare everything in advance before you go to bed so that you work out in the morning. Or if you don't feel like it, if you want to uh, run 5K, but you don't feel like it, you may tone it down and run just 300 meters and call that a workout. And that still makes progress. And the fourth step is to make it satisfying because that way you can complete the feedback loop, you get the reward, and then you get the incentive and the motivation to do, to do that again because you'll anticipate the reward. So I want to embed these sort of um, steps, let's say, into my own teaching experience so that my students can have a good time in my courses. So first of all, I make it obvious. Scala is this functional language that allows you to write very complex systems very quickly and very safely. So that immediately raises their attention. We have this, um, we have a million different uh, companies writing their critical systems in Scala, like ING and Adobe and Apple and so on and so forth. So this is pretty obvious, you use them every day. Make it attractive. Wouldn't be nice if you write a critical system, a very powerful system in just 300 lines of code. 
And that, again, raises their attention. That sounds enticing. Make it easy. That's my job. I want to design a, a simple learning experience so that everything clicks without too much mental effort on my audience's part. So this is something that I personally contribute to the most. And the satisfying bit, the fourth step, almost happens by itself because as engineers, we get nice satisfaction after making something work. So after we made a, a nice system work correctly, we get, an, we get a nice high. That's why we're programmers. We make things work. We're engineers. Now, in terms of Scala adoption, we can embed the same principles to um, um, reinforce this uh, habit loop into our audience, into the audience of the Scala language itself. So we can make it obvious. We can uh, write a, uh, let's say, a statement of what Scala can do. Programming distributed systems is hard. This is this uh, problem that we want to solve. But you can solve it more easily with Scala and this tools, these tools that we're making. And look at these companies that are writing their critical systems in Scala, and their help, Scala has helped them a lot. So this is pretty obvious itself. We can make it attractive. We can say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if, we, you know, if you can write a very powerful system in just 30 lines of code or 300 lines of code? That would be very cool. We need to make it easy, and this is what I've uh, this is what my work has been about at Rock the JVM, to make Scala as easy to learn a language as possible. So here's how you can make an HTTP uh, server in just 10 lines of code, or here's a Monad tutorial that you can understand in 15 minutes, or things of that sort. And finally, we can make it satisfying because um, after you uh, have made a critical system or like a big-ish thing, like a small Twitter in 2,000 lines of code, that would be pretty, that would be pretty cool. So um, this bit almost takes care of itself after we've taken care of the first three steps. So hopefully by the end of this talk, we have some, um, at, at least some ideas of what it makes to uh, learn and teach effectively. So hopefully we can make a Scala an easy language to learn and teach, and hopefully we can help it spread. So Scala rocks. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Here for help, any questions.